A new direction for one of Colorado's largest school districts. Tonight's the night in Douglas County. An unexpected impact of the pandemic is lingering in the places where comfort animals are missed. If you're an animal lover your whole life, that doesn't stop just because you're nearing the end. The long, long road for any Ukrainian who wants to start a new life in Colorado. Remembering neighbors lost in Boulder, and saluting the strength of a community that's been through the unimaginable and is tougher than a lot of people give it credit for. All that is next. Colorado's third largest school district, Dugco, is such a perfect example of how politics is steeped with education these days that Dugco has been written about everywhere lately from the New York Times to Fox News Channel. Well, it is a big night in Dugco tonight as the school board is expected to choose a new superintendent to replace the one they abruptly fired. The board's currently in a closed door executive session right now. These folks are waiting to hear whether they choose Aaron Kane or Danny Windsor. Those are the two finalists for superintendent. We expect several hours of public comment and the actual votes not expected before 9 p.m. It would be a shocker if the conservative board majority does not select Aaron Kane. They actually reached out to the charter school director and former interim superintendent before they fired the last one. Kane has advocated for allowing charter schools to arm teachers, opt out of public health and equity guidelines, though she has said recently she does not want Dugco's classroom teachers carrying weapons. The other finalist is Danny Windsor, who is the executive director for the Parker region within the school district. He also oversees the district's choice programming department. Tonight, the board's also expected to discuss, at least privately, how they should respond to a judge's injunction ordering the conservative majority to stop holding private one-on-one -on -one meetings to get around Colorado's open meeting law. Those board members want to appeal the decision. Comfort animals brought by their handlers to schools, and hospitals, and hospices, they were not around during the worst of the pandemic for obvious reasons. And they haven't all returned now, even with restrictions lifted. Denver Hospice, for one, misses their impact so much they asked our Steve Steger to publicly invite them back. Smiles don't come naturally in a place this somber. Come on, Ollie. Let's go. Though they do come naturally when Ollie, Ollie walks hello? in. Look who's here. Their eyes just light up and he gets excited. He comes right over to them. Julie Schwartz has been bringing Ollie to Denver Hospice for years. Oh, this is Ollie Jingles. He's a therapy dog. Providing a happy Ollie distraction Jingles. for staff members who have a heavy job and comfort. I'm here with my therapy dog. They thought she might like a visit. She's sleeping. Comfort to those nearing the end and the people around them. There have been times where he's actually taken me into a room. The hospice patient had passed just within minutes in the bed, and there was a woman sitting in the chair, and he went right over to her. Difficult work, important work. And we've had a daughter say, Dad, there's a dog in the room. Do you want to do you want to pet the dog? And their hand will slowly open, and you know, we hadn't seen anything in, in days. Kristen Coleman is the volunteer coordinator for Denver Hospice. In general, our volunteer program took a little bit of a dip during the pandemic. You're welcome. She Have says the pet day. therapy teams that came pretty regularly before the pandemic haven't returned as quickly as they'd expect now that restrictions keeping them away have been lifted. Some volunteers are older and naturally still concerned about COVID. Denver Hospice is still taking precautions, though, screening everyone who walks in the door and still requiring masks. We're starting to feel a little bit normal again, and volunteers want to give back. They want volunteers who feel comfortable to know that they are still welcome. And hopefully this piece will help with recruitment efforts, because I know there are people out there who got dogs for the first time during the pandemic. Welcome to bring a natural smile. Hello back into this somber place. If you're an animal lover your whole life, that doesn't stop just because you're nearing the end. If you want to volunteer to bring your therapy pet to Denver Hospice, they need to have a certification or at least intend to be certified. One program that helps provide therapy certification for animals, the nonprofit Denver Pet Partners. They told me that they saw the same issue. A lot of their volunteers were older and worried about venturing out during COVID. The good news, they say that they have seen an influx of volunteers, Kyle, influx of club volunteers who want to be trained, want to be able to yeah. do this work. Probably a lot of people who got a pet during the pandemic sure. and say, 
they have the temperament to do this. Let's figure out how to do it. I think a lot of people too are just kind of hungry for service again. Now that those opportunities have opened up in the community. And this means so much, not only to the patients at the hospice, but their families and the other folks there. I, th I think about times when we've had uh, like therapy dogs brought here to the station after something traumatic. Mm -hmm. It helps everyone in the building. It helps staff, or the staff at the hospice who have a tremendously difficult job. They say they jump at this opportunity. They love it. just that moment of being able to pet something. It just kind of eases that stress in the most stressful moment. I think back to a year ago this week, the Boulder shooting, the one thing that was magnetic outside that table Mesa King Supers was when they brought the Golden Retriever therapy dogs in and so many people lined up and knelt and just wept and it was unbelievable. All right, Steve, thank you. It was one year ago today that Boulder was added to the long list of American cities where someone with a gun has changed a community. 10 innocent lives were taken on that day at the table Mesa King Supers. A remembrance ceremony was held this afternoon to honor those killed at the grocery store. And King Super's locations around the state held a moment of silence at 2.30 in the afternoon when the shooting happened. Boulder's mayor told those gathered today that one terrible day does not define that community. It's an important step in the healing process to, to mourn those that we've lost, but also to celebrate the contributions that they made and to remember them. It's not something that you ever fully recover of, right? It becomes part of your identity, but it doesn't define us as a community. I think what really defines us is how we've come together since the shooting, you know, how, how everyone within the city and outside the city has come together to support each other in the aftermath. Boulder plans to build a permanent memorial somewhere in town to honor the 10 people who died. The city says no plans are ready to be announced. There's also going to be some kind of a permanent memorial there at the store site. In the days following the shooting last year, you responded to the needs of the Boulder community with support and prayer and donations to help the families of the victims. Community Foundation Boulder County partnered with the city and some small nonprofits to help victims' families in the community through the Boulder County Crisis Fund. $1.6 million in total was raised by the community. Nearly $300,000 of that came from your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign. One year later, we can give you a good idea of how your donations were put to use. The Community Foundation reports that about $1 million of what was raised went to direct assistance for the families of the 10 people who were killed, the 28 people injured, and the 300 people who were there when it happened, the witnesses. That money was distributed through the Colorado Organization for Victims Assistance, COVA. Another quarter million dollars went toward mental health programs, including a variety of trauma-based therapies for survivors and community members. The foundation says about 145,000 went to community engagement grants for things like healing events and classes, and about 160,000 went to the Museum of Boulder to preserve a memorial that was moved there and to fund some other projects related to the shooting. Boulder is the butt of a lot of jokes, usually about politics place with a reputation for being on one end or the other of the political spectrum is going to get that. But it deserves another reputation. Boulder and Boulder County are tough as hell because they've been through it in the last two years and that community is still standing strong. Beyond the pandemic that everyone faced at once, they had the Calwood and the Left Hand Canyon fires in 2010, the King Super shooting one year ago today that took 10 beloved neighbors, then the Marshall Fire last year, two lives lost, 1,000 families' homes burned. Yet Boulder and Boulder County stand strong. Neighbors supporting neighbor, communities rebuilding lives and homes on their terms with strength, and determination, and compassion. Faced with the worst from both humans and nature, Boulder and Boulder County have proven they are as tough as any community in Colorado.
More than 3 million Ukrainians have fled to safety in other countries. Unlike what we saw with the mass evacuation of Afghans who had helped U.S. forces, there's no official fast track for Ukrainian refugees who want to come to the U.S. Our Kitty Eastman found a few have already arrived, while others may have to wait years. Three women at this table, Irina, Tatiana, and Katerina, were forced to leave the men they love in Ukraine and find safety with family members in Denver. And then they made a decision to move to their house outside in, in the country, but today this house is destroyed. They tell their stories to Democratic Representative Diana DeGette and the Denver Executive Director of the International Rescue Committee, Jennifer Wilson. They don't feel safe because the country is in the war. These women would not have been able to get to Colorado so quickly without family already here. Wilson says the wait for most Ukrainian refugees to get to the U.S. is still about two years. While we may see refugees from this conflict, at present there's no expedited mechanism. Representative DeGette says Congress and the White House are working on that. We think that with the refugee resettlement program being authorized by the administration in early March, that that Denver and Colorado may be getting um, a lot more refugees. Colorado is a welcoming state for refugees, but it's hard to find affordable housing. Wilson says of the 700 Afghani families her agency helped to resettle, a third of them are still in temporary housing. But Wilson says many Ukrainians are hoping a home in the U.S is not permanent. We recognize that most of the people displaced really just want to go home, and it is the best and most preferable option if we can restore safety in the country for people to return. Another unknown for the women at this table and millions of Ukrainians. For Next, I'm Katie Eastman. The Biden administration has extended temporary protected status to Ukrainians who are already here and the few who have arrived recently. That means that they can legally stay and work while it's not safe to return. The family of a Coloradan killed at Pearl ha Harbor now has a measure of peace as the remains of Navy water tender first class Milo Phillips have finally been identified after more than 80 years. Phillips was from Pierce, north of Greeley. He was assigned to the battleship USS Oklahoma. The ship was attacked by Japanese aircraft on December 7, 1941. There were 429 crewmen aboard the ship killed, including Phillips. The remains of the crew were recovered over a two and a half year period from 1941 to 1944, but only 35 of the men were properly identified at the time. It wasn't until about five years ago that the unidentified remains were all taken and exhumed from a cemetery in Honolulu to be identified. Anthropological analysis and DNA analysis identified Phillips last year, but his family wasn't fully briefed on that identification until recently. He'll be properly reburied in August, the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific. It's an exceptionally fiery debate in the Colorado legislature considering that the bill doesn't actually change abortion rights in our state. And a familiar name pops up on a plan for a huge project in northern Colorado. That's next. The Colorado Senate is currently in the middle of an hours-long debate tonight on a bill over abortion rights. This is the same bill that prompted a marathon 24-hour debate in the State House two weekends ago. The bill duplicates existing abortion rights into state law. That's in case Roe v. Wade is thrown out by the Supreme Court. The 15 Republicans in the Colorado State Senate have said that they're going to vote against making abortion rights part of state law. They have said that it's going to allow what they refer to as on-demand abortions for the full 40 weeks of pregnancy, including late-term abortions. According to the state health department, 10,368 pregnancies were terminated in Colorado in 2020. Late-term abortion is not a medical term. That's more of a political slogan, but it's usually used to refer to an abortion that happens after the start of the second trimester, so 13 weeks and on. According to the state, 890 of the pregnancies terminated in Colorado in 2020 were after the 13th week. So it's about 9% of the abortions done in the state that year. A majority of abortions that year, more than 75%, were done at the eight-week mark or earlier. Coloradans already have access to abortions after the 13-week mark, but there are not a lot of providers doing that. It's the idea that those would then increase if the bill becomes law there's simply been no evidence presented.
Windy and chilly along the Front Range today. The wind continues tonight and tomorrow ahead of a nice warming trend that'll get us into the 70s by the weekend. Gusty winds to 40 and 50 miles per hour, creating areas of blowing snow as wind-driven snow travels from north to south along the Front Range on the heels of our fast-moving storm, creating severe weather across the south tonight. Advisories for wind across southeastern Colorado and a high wind watch tomorrow from Denver down to Pueblo. We only have isolated snow showers tonight and then skies will clear and a mostly sunny day expected tomorrow. How about mid 60s on Thursday and Friday with 70s for your weekend? Chance for rain with this next storm we're tracking Tuesday into Wednesday of next week. Amazon's getting a new fulfillment center in Loveland and they've picked a company involved in a bid rigging controversy in Denver to be the contractor. That new fulfillment center is planned for a 152 acre piece of property annexed by the city near County Road 30 and I-25. It's going to be a 600,000 square foot facility where they'll pack up and ship out orders. The city expects it to employ more than 1,000 people. The developer is Trammell Crow, one of the companies that had to pay millions of dollars to the city of Denver after being found it was vi that they violated the city's public procurement rules during the early stages of the expansion of the convention center in 2018. The city terminated its contract with Trammell Crow after it was found that employees had swapped confidential information with Mortensen Construction during the bidding. Both companies were fined $4.5 million. Mortensen Construction was banned from bidding on Denver City contracts for three years. Greeley-based Hensel Phelps Construction was recommended by the city and county of Denver to move forward with the uh, convention center expansion project. It's a sign of a very public typo. Prominent road. Is there such thing as whiteout for road signs? That your feedback next. It's a sign that every construction crew could use at least one grammar cop. A new roundabout opened up recently in Edgewater, 24th and Pierce, where drivers are warned to yield. So be sure if you're in that area that you yield to traffic that is already in the roundabout. The internet found out about this and it prompted a pretty quick fix. Brett sent us a photo of that work beginning out there this morning. Uh, if a sign tells you to uh, yield or anything else that you think is unusual, take a photo and email next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext on Twitter. A note tonight from Jill, who emails in about our coverage of the one-year mark since the shooting at the King Supers in Boulder County and all that community has been through in the last two years. She says, thank you for the wonderful words about how strong Boulder County is. It's been a tough couple of years, but I have seen firsthand, Jill says, the generous spirit, not only of Boulder County, but also of the state and the country. Thoughtful feedback abounds tonight. B writes in to say, can you imagine anyone more communist than Kyle? It's a tough one, B. I'm not stalling. I'm trying to come up with an answer.